Today I was able to visit a Nishi Hongwanji, which is basically a Buddhist temple. And the two major things that we did during this tour was we went to a big chapel and a small chapel. I'm in the big chapel um, right now. Welcome to Los Angeles Hopo Hongwanji Buddhist Temple. Our members are very happy to have invited you to listen to the teachings of the Buddha and more than happy to talk about our temple. Just celebrated its 123rd anniversary. So it's been here for quite a while serving the Japanese community for quite a long time. The Issei and Nisei and now Sanseis and, and Goseis are part of this temple. So it's a, it comes from a long generation of, of temple pioneers. First thing you probably noticed was everyone who's not Buddhist or even Buddhist, they see that we have pews and they say, what's up with that? <laughs> because, you know, the stereotypical is that we sit on our on the floor. Not, they don't even do that in Japan anymore. They have little chairs. Uh, and uh, it doesn't really have this feeling of a temple. I think this is one of the misconceptions that Americans have about temples, that they think it, it, it's run by monks and it's a monastery. I'm not a monk, and this isn't a monastery. We're heavily influenced by Christianity. This is why we have, t uh, we have pews, we have an organ, we have a pulpit, and altar is raised as well. It's all reminiscent of of Christianity. And so you have to understand the, the history of when the Japanese came to the U.S. back a hundred years ago. It was a hostile environment and they had to kind of blend in or fly under the radar. Buddhism is very adaptable. So when Buddhism came from India, it moved to China and it absorbed some of the uh, Chinese tradition, Confucianism. We still do some of the uh, ritual from China here in the temple. When Buddhism went from China to Japan, Shinto was there already, and it absorbed a lot of Shinto tradition in, in Japanese Buddhism. And then when Buddhism moved to from Japan to the U.S., it absorbed a lot of the Christian traditions. And this is what what you see here is that this this is all history. This is what made the Japanese American Japanese American. In this chapel, we were able to talk to the sensei and um, he basically told us about the murals on the wall and basically like the shrine that's over there and what they do. This is not Buddha on the altar. It's Amida Buddha. We don't necessarily worship Sakamuni Buddha like most Buddhists do. There's a story that it's connected to this. It's about Amida Buddha. Amida Buddha is an easier path. This is why Shinran fellow out there in the statue. This is why it's so popular because anyone can practice Chota Shinshu. It's easy. So these are the uh, murals that were painted, especially for this temple back uh, 50 years ago. It's a story of the historical Shakyamuni who lived 2,500 years ago. It depicts many of the highlights of his life. The first one is the mythical birth of our conception of Shakyamuni Buddha. Queen Maya was impregnated symbolically by a white elephant. This is much like Jesus Christ and Mary. The mother goes back to the mother's house to give birth. On the way, she gave birth. Siddhartha Gautama just popped out <laughs> and it took seven steps. And that is very significant in that seven steps represent transcending the six realms of existence. The king was informed by a soothsayer that his son would either become a king or a religious leader, a famous religious leader. And so because of that, he, he didn't want Shakyamuni to go out into the world and see poverty and, and the horrors of, of very regular life. The king had protected him from seeing those things. And so on this side of the wall, the mural depicts a incident that happened. There was a parade going down a village and so Dr. Gautama, at that time now he became, he's Shakyamuni Buddha. He had a cousin, Devadatta. Uh, he always wanted to kill Shakyamuni because he was very jealous of Shakyamuni. And so he knew that there was a parade going down the village. And so he had drugged the elephants. So he would stampede and kill Shakyamuni. But because Shakyamuni was enlightened, he was able to calm the elephants down before anyone got hurt. So this picture depicts the death of Shakyamuni Buddha. So the story goes that, that he was visiting a, one of the, his patrons and he invited Shakyamuni to attend and give a sermon. But Shakyamuni was already sick. For dinner, he was invited to partake in some pork. And uh, he ate the pork and the next day he died. So, so I think this is where the story goes, where Buddhists 
don't eat meat. Buddhists will eat anything that's offered to them. It's because it's, it's impolite. And the last is when he, in the state of nirvana, uh, he was already enlightened when he died. Nirvana means the state blowing out, much like a candle. So that's, it's blowing out this idea of, of duality. The idea of one versus the other is gone. That's kind of the understanding of nirvana. You're in a state of, of bliss. There's no more black and white, hate and love, that kind of duality. Across the hall, there's a smaller chapel where he basically just told us about the history of Buddhism. In that small chapel, they basically house their loved ones and people who have passed. And it was just really cool to see the many people that used to visit in the past. This is the Nakotsudo, as I said. Uh, this is where we house our loved ones who've passed on. It's a way to show our appreciation and gratitude for their lives, that you know, we are the benefactors of their lives, of their causes and conditions. This is what kind of defines Buddhists. Some Buddhists believe that there's this reincarnation, this birth and death. There's a soul that continues. Uh, but within our tradition, is that's not the case. We believe that when someone passes, they become a Buddha automatically. A lot of times, People have a misconception that all Buddhists are the same. That's further from the truth. For example, the Dalai Lama and, and us are, are so far apart. And so a lot of times people think that the Dalai Lama is like the incarnation of the Buddha, but that's what they say, but that's not our understanding. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times um, people have a misconception that all Buddhists are the same. Everyone believes in Shakyamuni Buddha. His, the, the whole story of Shakyamuni Buddha. We all have different ways of expressing that understanding of what is enlightenment? What, how do you get there? Who becomes enlightened? That's kind of how we divide our branches, the Mahayana Buddhists and the Theravada Buddhists and the Vajrayana Buddhists. Depends on how you view enlightenment, nirvana, and, uh, and the practice. This is what defines what kind of Buddhist you are. Sensei, thank you so much for today. It was Beautiful. The grounds are beautiful. We really appreciate you. your time. My students, I'm sure, have a few questions. I'll start, if that's okay. okay. Sure. Do you have any holidays or festivals that you celebrate? Yes, we do. Um, it's called Obon. It's in the summer. It's a festival for our ancestors. This appreciation and gratitude is really important in Jodo Shinshu. And so we, what we do is we dance tradition of folklore, and then we have a, a service, and then we do a service for all those people who have died since the last of one. In Japan, what they do is their understanding is you put out the lanterns so the, the dead people can find their way back. It's beautiful though. So, yeah. you know, it, again, this is the way we define Buddhism, how, what, how we treat our death, our loved ones. Uh, sensei, how, how does one reach enlightenment? We use this metaphor. Uh, this is how we describe the different traditions of Buddhism. There are different, say there's the top of the mountain and there's different ways to get up. You can walk, you can run, you can take a helicopter, you can drive up in a bus, you can ride a motorcycle. There's all these different ways to become enlightened. It depends on how your practice is and then how you define the top of the mountain. We don't think we can become enlightened. There's an intermediary between the enlightenment and living in this world. We, we call it the samsara, this constant struggle, suffering here in this world. Um, and so how you bypass that is different with all traditions. Some Buddhists believe that you have to meditate and do difficult practices. Some Buddhists believe you have to live in a monastery and live from all these worldly blind passions. All these uh, traditions are, are valid. Depends on, on your condition, how you grew up, or how you have your own personal experiences. For me, I know I cannot become enlightened. It's just impossible. Everything I do is, is based on my ego. So it's like I took Zen for a while. So Zen is supposed to be really ground yourself. And what happened was I was going around saying, oh man, I'm so good at, at meditation. And that just, that's just like, it's like it's saying that I'm humble. So it doesn't work. And also outside there was a really cool bell that I saw. I'm not really too sure what they do with that bell, but I do know that it was cool. And yeah, so I had a really fun time. Thank you very much for uh, coming by and uh, learning about a little bit about our, our, our religion. Mm -hmm.